Welcome to the most impactful week in the movement to end prostate cancer. We're so glad you're here. This event is about you and connecting with experts, advocates, and communities from across the country. Together, we are Zero Strong. Please join us right now for the Virtual Zero Prostate Cancer Summit. Hi everyone, I'm Shelby Monier, Vice President of Zero's Patient Programs and Education. Welcome back to day two of our 2021 Virtual Summit. I'm thrilled to introduce you to two of Zero's Medical Advisory Board members who are joining us today to share the latest in prostate cancer treatment. This includes information on PARP inhibitors, immunotherapies, as well as what patients with localized disease need to know about active surveillance and imaging. Dr. Kelvin Moses is a co-chair of Zero's Racial Disparities Task Force and a member of Zero's Medical Advisory Board. He joins us from Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Dr. Moses will be followed by Dr. Alicia Morgans, chair of Zero's Medical Advisory Board, joining us from the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. Dr. Moses, Dr. Morgans, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Shelby, for the kind introduction, and thank you to everyone who is participating in Zero's 2021 Annual Symposium. Dr. Morgans and I will be presenting on prostate cancer, screening, diagnosis, and treatment options. I will begin starting with localized disease. These are my disclosures. So just to begin with the basics, here's the prostate anatomy. As you can see, the prostate sits just below the bladder and in front of the rectum. And that's how we do our examination of the backside of the prostate. You can also see a tube coming through the prostate and then out through the penis called the urethra. And that's how urine passes through the prostate, through the urethra and out the body. So what is the function of the prostate? It is actually a sex accessory organ and it helps break down semen for fertility. It comprises about two to three centimeters of the urethra. And as you can see in the picture depicted here, the transitional zone is what enlarges and causes symptoms, which we know as BPH or enlarged prostate. The normal size of the prostate is about 20 to 25 grams or about the size of a walnut but it does grow as we get older and again can cause urinary symptoms. Some basics about prostate cancer, it is the most common solid organ cancer in men in the United States and is the second most common cause of cancer death. Importantly, it is actually more prevalent and presents at more aggressive stage in black men. In fact, black men in the United States have the highest incidence in the world and over twice the mortality or risk of death from prostate cancer compared to white men in the United States. There are many factors that play into this, but the largest is that black men are less likely to receive screening for prostate cancer and to receive treatment after diagnosis. To define screening, it comprises the PSA or prostate specific antigen blood test and DRE or digital rectal examination to feel the prostate. The current screening guidelines vary somewhat between the various organizations, but the one common element is that they all emphasize shared decision-making. Starting with the American Urological Association, they encourage shared decision-making for men starting at age 55 up to age 69 with normal life expectancy. They do suggest selective screening in younger men starting at age 40 who are at higher risk. And that includes men with a positive family history or black men. They also state that some men who are older than 70 who are in excellent health may benefit from screening, but this should, this should be a select population. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network or NCCN also discusses shared decision-making beginning in men aged at 45 up to the age of 75. They do say that frequency of testing can be lengthened uh, based on their baseline measurement. So up to two, uh, two years or longer between measurements. Again, in very select older men, uh, you can perform screening. The United States Preventive Services Task Force gives prostate cancer screening a grade of C. And what that means is that the men 
at age of 55 to 69 in reasonable health should discuss the risk and benefits of screening if they wish to consider. So why is screening important and what is the importance of stage? So in the United States, uh, from data from 2018, you can see here that men who are diagnosed with localized disease or confined to the prostate comprises 76% of men diagnosed with prostate cancer. Regional disease or spread to lymph nodes is 13% and metastatic disease is 6%. Stage is important because five-year survival varies tremendously between localized and regional disease, which are at 100%, versus distant disease or metastatic disease, which drops all the way down to 30%. So therefore, it is very important uh, that men are diagnosed at an earlier stage of disease in order to enjoy a normal lifespan. Now, there has been some controversy about screening. Uh, there is uh, Pretty well known that the United States Preventive Services Task Force initially gave prostate cancer screening a D grade or not recommended. And we noticed something over time uh, that happened uh, with not only screening, but the diagnosis of prostate cancer. The very bottom line in red shows diagnosis of colon cancer over that same period of time, just to show stability. On the left half of the graph, you can see that uh, the line, the top line, which represents low risk disease was actually on an incline. Whereas intermediate risk and high risk disease, which are the red and blue lines were relatively flat. However, to the right of the screen, you can see that all the lines for low risk, intermediate risk and high risk are all on the decline after the USPSTF gave prostate cancer screening in D grade. Now, we like the top line going down. That means fewer low-grade cancers are being diagnosed, which is good. However, fewer higher-risk cancers are being dosed, diagnosed. And this is bad because what that means is we are missing aggressive cancers that probably need to be treated. And what we've seen uh, in that time is that the, the risk of high risk disease has actually gone up. Uh, here in this paper from Dr. Banerjee, you can see that the MECO high risk, and we'll talk more about risk stages, the relative risk is up 25% of the diagnosing high risk cancer. And these men are at high risk, not only of uh, cancer recurrence if they get treated, but at risk of death if there's progression. Uh, this was early data, this is from 2015, but it does show a problematic trend. A lot of what the USPSTF guided their decisions on were randomized trials performed in the United States and in Europe. The United States trial unfortunately had some contamination issues and therefore the data is not reliable. However, the European study did show a slight difference when they initially reported at seven years. However, the difference was, was quite small, and they made a point that there is a significant amount of harms from overdiagnosis and overtreatment. However, at 13 years of follow-up, you can see the survival as uh, the survival curves have split quite significantly at 13 years. The control group, or the men who did not receive screening on that red line, has a much higher esti uh, estimate or risk of death from prostate cancer compared to those who receive screening in the blue line. And that, that shows that prostate cancer does have quite a long lifespan, but screening at an early stage can save lives at a, at a time period of 10 or more years. And that emphasizes why we uh, suggest that men have good reasonable lifespan, good health in order to under, undergo screening. Further evidence uh, shows from the European study that metastatic disease is much lower, uh, much less commonly diagnosed over time. In the far right column, uh, zero to 13 years, there's a 40% reduction in risk of metastatic uh, disease being diagnosed or a PSA of 100. And so the conclusion from this paper is that it confirms that prostate cancer screening reduces metastatic disease 
at diagnosis in the screening arm and precedes mortality reduction by almost three years. So what are the implications of screening? Uh, the good thing is that uh, with knowledge of uh, screening the appropriate men, uh, fewer lower grade cancers are diagnosed. There's possibly decreased anxiety over fluctuations in PSA levels, and there's less exposure to diagnostic and treatment risks. However, less screening does potentially cause missed treatable intermediate and high risk disease. It does decrease the opportunity for refinement of screening tools. And I, although I did not discuss the data, Black uninsured and less edu educated populations actually see even lower screening rates and thus a high risk population is at higher exposure for uh, death from disease. Just briefly, I will discuss how the recent COVID-19 pandemic, which is unfortunately ongoing, has affected cancer related patient outcomes. And this study published last year in JCO Clinical Cancer Information, I show here that uh, cancer screenings for mammograms and colorectal cancer dropped dramatically at the beginning of 2020. Uh, and it is uh, not unreasonable to assume that prostate cancer screening uh, had the same effect. Additionally, there was a drop in incidence of, of all can or many cancers uh, from the beginning of uh, 2020 through April. And within this line, you can see that prostate cancer, which is the green line at the top, declined. And uh, again, we probably are not diagnosing as many low risk cancers, which is fine, but we are potentially missing higher grade cancers due to the pandemic. So as we discussed, PSA is part of the screening and many people will ask, well, what is a normal PSA? And there's really no cutoff for PSA where there is no cancer. We've seen people with a PSA of 1.5 that have cancer and a PSA of 20 that don't. What's important is that we take into account the age of a person, size of the prostate and prior PSA measurements to determine the importance of that particular number. Of note, a PSA of six in a man in his 80s is not nearly as concerning as a PSA of six in a man of his 50s. If the PSA is concerning, your doctor may recommend prostate biopsy. So what to do if the PSA is elevated? If minimally elevated, repeat in three to six months to confirm that number. If there's true evidence of infection, a urinary tract infection or prostatitis, then you should give antibiotics. However, if it's significantly elevated, you can consider getting an MRI and or proceed directly to prostate biopsy. How is a prostate biopsy performed? Usually an ultrasound probe is placed within the rectum, just like when the finger is placed for rectal exam. And we do what are called sextant biopsies. We divide the prostate into six different areas and then do two biopsies in each area. So most, most urologists now will do 12, 10 to 12 biopsies of the prostate. Now there are newer technologies that are used for performing biopsy. Uh, for men who get an MRI of the prostate, there are uh, two, proto, uh, two platforms, one called Euronav and one called Artemis, which will actually fuse the MRI images which, with what is seen by ultrasound in order to specifically target concerning areas. Additionally, if you get another fusion biopsy down the road, it actually records the previous data and you can specifically target a, a, a same area again or look for different areas. Now, once the biopsy is performed, the biopsies are sent to a pathologist and placed on a slide. And what they look at is the aggressiveness of the tissue according to what is called the Gleason grading scale. I've X'd out grade two because that's not really called anymore. And so you will see as tumor aggressiveness increases, the grade goes from three to four to five for the most aggressive. And what the pathologist does is take the two most common patterns and add them together to give the Gleason sum. So for example, if the majority, if there's cancer is grade three and there's a small amount of four, then the Gleason grade is three plus four equals seven. Therefore, patterns uh, range from a Gleason number of six 
to a Gleason of 10. If you remember, I talked about cancer risk stratification, one of the classifications called the D'Amico, uh, and it takes into account the PSA, the Gleason score, and the clinical exam or the digital rectal exam, and is divided to low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk disease. In order to meet the low risk criteria, you have to have all of the, all of the uh, classifications of a PSA of less than 10, a Gleason score of six, and either a normal rectal exam or a small nodule on one side of the prostate. Intermediate risk and high risk then include higher PSAs or a Gleason number of seven or eight to 10 or an abnormal exam. If you are diagnosed with high risk disease, then you should get imaging in the form of a bone scan and a CT scan. And we'll discuss imaging further here. So what a bone scan is, if you receive a radionucleotide that is injected in the vein and wait a small period of time, and then take an x-ray of the entire skeleton. And what this does is determine if there's spread of prostate cancer to the bones. You should also get a, a CT or an MRI, and this can help determine if there's spread to lymph nodes or other organs. Additionally, especially with an MRI, you can do surgical planning because you could see the neurovascular bundles near the prostate, as well as the sphincter, and get an accurate determination of size. For patients with concern of more advanced disease, there are some newer technologies, such as the PSMA PET CT, which was recently approved by the FDA. Again, this is a gallium-based PET, PET scan that can uh, very highly sensitive test to detect metastatic disease. Also, there's the flucyclovine PET-CT, also known as the Axiomen scan. And again, this is a uh, radio tracer that is injected that can be highly detected with specialized PET-CT to determine if there's recurrence or spread of disease. So what are the treatment options for localized prostate cancer? Watchful waiting is best used in patients who are much older or those who have significant comorbidity. So someone who is highly ill with significant heart disease or dementia or lung disease. We can also provide androgen deprivation therapy, which is used to block testosterone production. Now, this is most commonly used in patients with metastatic disease, but can also be used in patients who have biochemical recurrence after primary therapy. It's usually given in three to six month increments with injection of what's called an LHRH analog, most commonly like Lupron. Or you can perform an orchiectomy uh, to immediately reduce testosterone. Sometimes this can be combined with an antiandrogen such as Casidex. What's being commonly used now, particularly for men with low risk disease, is active surveillance. And so this is appropriate for patients with low PSA, a Gleason number of six, and a normal exam. Uh, one of the other classification schema known as the NCCN got, uh, classification, there's actually a very low risk category. And so these men have Gleason six, PSA of less than 10, and very few positive cores, a normal examination, uh, and they also PSA density, which is quite low. What this does is it allows men to avoid treatment for what is essentially non-fatal disease, and that way they can avoid the uh, risk and side effects of treatment. However, because of frequent follow-ups, it does allow for timely treatment if there is progression of disease within the prostate. A common example of how active surveillance is performed, you do a PSA every six months, you would repeat a biopsy at six months after the initial one, uh, which is called a confirmatory biopsy, and then perform biopsies at every 12 to 24 months, depending on the PSA trajectory. Then men can consider treatment if the Gleason rises above six or there's more cores that are positive with cancer. Now, when defining localized treatment, there's two major categories of radiation therapy and surgery. Radiation therapy can be given with or without hormone therapy depending on the risk level of the patient. And there are several types of radiation therapy. There's external beam radiation, conformal radiation, 
uh, more commonly now as intensity modulated radiation therapy. These are all external forms. There are implanted radiation Cs, which is called brachytherapy, and you can actually have low dose or high dose rate brachytherapy, again, depending on your risk category. And then there's combinations of the above. Most commonly men will come in and get uh, highly advanced imaging in order to define the prostate, which you can see here in red, the tissue surrounding the prostate, which you can see as the yellow stripe, and then the areas beyond that, which you do not want to uh, target with radiation therapy. There are other techniques in order to prevent damage uh, to the bladder and rectum, particu particularly, sorry, uh, a gel called space ore that can be injected between the prostate and rectum. And this is a sample of what a machine would look like. A man is lying on a table and uh, based on the imaging that was done before, you have beams that are targeted towards the prostate. These typically last anywhere from a couple of weeks to uh, over just over a month. The main side effects we'll discuss more in detail. So when it comes to surgery, there's also different uh, categories of this. Uh, there's open surgery, which is called either radical retropubic or perineal prostatectomy, which is uh, probably not done very much anymore. However, I would say in this country now, the majority of men receive minimally invasive surgery, uh, mostly with robotic assisted prostatectomy with a few uh, high volume surgeons doing laparoscopic. And I would say probably 90 to 95% of prostatectomies now are done in a minimally invasive fashion. For a radical prostatectomy, there's an incision in the lower part of the abdomen and you dissect the prostate away. So here you can see on the left side where the prostate is sitting between the bladder and the urethra. And to the right, the prostate has been removed and the bladder is now connected to the urethra to establish continuity for urine flow. As I said, more commonly now is a robotic approach. You can see here in this picture, the patient is sitting below the arms on the right side of that picture. And the surgeon is off to the left on a console controlling those arms. Those arms are going through ports that are inserted into the abdomen. And what the surgeon sees is a very highly magnified uh, picture of within the pelvis. And so uh, the proponents of robotics will state that they have less blood loss, better visualization, and potentially better way of sparing the perineural, or sorry, uh, neurovascular bundles near the prostate to help with erectile function and with urinary contents. There are other treatments of the prostate that can be performed, such as cryotherapy, which is freezing of the prostate, high food, which is called high intensity focused ultrasound which essentially is using ultrasonic waves to increase the temperature within the prostate and target specific tumors. Now for metastatic or hormone resistant disease, Dr. Morgans will get more in detail with this, but there's chemotherapy, immunotherapy, vaccine therapy, and hormonal therapies. Some complications of treatment, um, most concerning of course would be disease recurrence or biochemical recurrence. Men who have received treatment must continue to check PSA uh, and treatment of biochemical recurrence depends on when it happens and how rapidly the PSA is rising. Uh, for patients who receive surgery first, you can get planned radiation uh, if there are high risk features or salvage radiation if the PSA is going up. You can do salvage surgery after radiation, but it is somewhat more difficult and that should go to very experienced surgeons uh, and with the knowledge that there are increased risk of complications. Additionally, some men will receive androgen deprivation to block testosterone production. So prostate cancer survivorship, the key to uh, a good successful life uh, after treatment for prostate cancer involves several elements. One, you should educate yourself before and after treatment so that you can know what your options are and to know what to expect. You should have a healthy diet and exercise. Um, all pa any patient with cancer who exercises regularly has a better survival and probably a better outlook on life than those who have a sedentary lifestyle. Take advantage of support resources, just like attending this Zero Summit. 
utilize your family and friends and uh, cancer advocacy groups such as the Prostate Cancer Coalition, uh, Zero, and the Prostate Health Education Network. And don't be afraid to discuss or ask questions. Uh, the men, especially since you're discussing such a sensitive topic, are not so likely in public at least to want to discuss erectile function or urinary leakage or even some of the various treatments. But don't be afraid to ask questions and use reputable resources when doing that. So in summary, screening for prostate cancer should be a shared decision-making process. And we should use this to avoid overdiagnosis in men who are not otherwise good candidates for treatment. Screening should begin around 40 to 55, depending on risk factors such as family history or black race. Patients with high risk disease should obtain imaging uh, with, uh, or there's evidence of PSA recurrence. There are several treatments that exist for localized cancer with the most commonly used being active surveillance for most men with low risk disease, and then uh, either some form of surgery or radiation for localized disease. There are unique risks and side effects for each of these treatments and you should educate yourself on those. And very importantly, men should do continued surveillance after treatment to guard against recurrence of disease. Thank you very much and we'll answer questions at the end. And I'd like to hand over the talk now to Dr. Morgan for her portion of the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Moses. I really appreciate that. What a wonderful initial presentation. So here's an outline of what we'll talk about next. We'll talk a little bit about COVID and prostate cancer, which obviously has been on all of our minds, then novel approaches to androgen deprivation therapy, as well as personalized medicine and new approvals, including PARP inhibitors, which happened just in 2020, then updated survival results for non-metastatic CRPC, including the Spartan, Aramis, and PROSPER trials, and then a a brief mention of novel radiopharmaceuticals for metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, including the therapy trial. So what a year it has been. I think that anyone who's attended the summit before, anyone who's really been in our zero family and anyone who's joining now knows that it has been an incredible year for all of us just as human beings, but also of course, for people dealing with prostate cancer, for the, for the men themselves, and for the people that, that love those men. Um, we've had a lot of concern about whether men with prostate cancer may be at higher risk of developing COVID-19, whether men may be more susceptible to the infection of coronavirus or more susceptible to becoming hospitalized or having other complications. And various groups, including the European societies, the American societies, including the AUA, the NCCN, ASCO, ESMO, EAU, and others have tried to help us understand how to best care for prostate cancer in these challenging times. What I can tell you from our experience and from these guidelines and from the, uh, the, the, the recommendations from societies worldwide is that men with prostate cancer are at higher risk just because they have cancer uh, of developing complications of COVID-19. However, men with prostate cancer specifically among all cancer patients don't seem to have a higher risk of any of these complications. I have had a number of patients with prostate cancer who have developed COVID-19. None have been hospitalized and thankfully none have had catastrophic complications. And I think that this has actually been the experience for a majority of physicians worldwide. Interestingly, it is wondered whether men who are being treated with androgen deprivation therapy actually may be protected somewhat against the complications of COVID-19. We don't actually know whether this is true or whether it's not, but what we know is that all of us have to maintain our social distancing, maintain our good practices, but men with prostate cancer seem to be relatively okay in the pandemic as compared to everyone else. And so we just need to be able to be sure that we maintain good hand hygiene, good social dis distancing, and wear our masks, and we hopefully can all be okay as a prostate cancer community. One good thing that has come out of all of this is that we are really more engaged in telehealth. And this can be via telephone, via video conferencing, but we're able to engage with our physicians from a remote practice in, in a more meaningful way. And this is happening much more often. And I think 
if there is anything that is good that has come out of all of the complications of COVID-19 and all of the issues that we've felt with the pandemic, this is one thing that may add some light uh, to the darkness. We also know, of course, that we are here on a, a, a virtual uh, organization day, that we are here to have a summit virtually, that we're all engaging via the, the web. And what I would encourage us all to take heart in and to remember is that together, we still are an unstoppable force. We are still here, we are strong. And the efforts that we make today and every day against prostate cancer are efforts that will be felt regardless of the pandemic, regardless of what happens otherwise. So let's talk about some other things related to prostate cancer, including some new hormonal therapy options, which are um, really unexpected, I would say, for many people in the prostate cancer community, because we've had androgen deprivation therapy, or ADT, for many decades, actually, at this point, um, and new takes are relatively, uh, relatively rare on all of this. So the HERO phase three trial was a, uh, an international trial of men with advanced prostate cancer who needed to have androgen deprivation therapy for their treatment. Men were randomized on this trial, this large trial of hundreds and hundreds of men to receive Relagolix, which was an oral or, or by mouth uh, pill that could lower testosterone levels or Luprolide, which is an injection that's been very commonly used to lower testosterone levels. These injections like Luprolide include things like Triptorolin, Luprolide, Gacerolin. These are things that we've used for many, many decades to cause low testosterone levels in men with prostate cancer and have not really been thought to necessarily be options in terms of oral uh, therapies. Well, Relagolix is a little bit different. It's an oral agent that can also cause a lower testosterone level. And what we saw in the HERO trial was that Relagolix actually could lower testosterone levels as effectively as these injection forms. You could see here that patients who had this low testosterone level were um, at least as suppressed as men who were receiving Luprolide, which is really one of the most common standard of care agents. So 96.7% of the oral agents patients actually had this low testosterone level as compared to 88.8% .8 of patients who had the injection. Interestingly, patients who were receiving that oral agent had a faster recovery of testosterone production after they stopped that agent. So we can see here on this little uh, pop-out box that when patients stopped their, uh, their treatment with the oral agent or with the injections, they had a faster rise to a higher level of testosterone by 90 days with the oral agent than they did with the injection. We also saw somewhat surprisingly, a really big difference in the degree of patients who experienced cardiovascular adverse events when they were treated with the oral agent, the Relagolix, as compared to Luprolide, that injection medication. So we've known for many years that androgen deprivation therapy in general can increase the risk of cardiovascular events, but that rate of increase seemed to be about half that with the oral agent of Relagolix than it was with Luprolide. And that you can see here, the adverse cardiovascular event rate was 3.9% with Relagolix and 7.1% with Luprolide, which is one of the most, common, most commonly used uh, injectable forms of ADT. Here we can see this in graphical form. And what I've written is to really look at that blue line versus that orange line. The blue line represents the rate of cardiovascular events over time. And you can see that rate sort of increasing over time for patients treated with the Luprolide agent versus the orange line, which is the rate over time of patients treated with Relagolix, the oral agent. And you can see the rate over time of patients treated with Relagolix was half that um, for cardiovascular events as it was for patients treated with Luprolide. So the blue line shows that Luprolide patients are more likely to have a cardiovascular event than the orange line, which is the Relagolix patients um, in terms of their cardiovascular events. So in conclusion, 
Relagolix is an oral form of androgen deprivation that is as effective in lowering testosterone as luprolide, but testosterone levels seem to recover to normal more quickly when the drug is stopped. And this is really good if you want those, those levels to recover. If, for example, you've used a short term of androgen deprivation therapy with radiation, for example. Um, but Relagolix also has a lower risk of cardiovascular side effects than luprolide. And, and we believe probably with other injectable forms of androgen deprivation therapy. So just something for us to consider as we move forward as a field. There are some other novel approvals. These include things like PARP inhibitors. So we know DNA repair um, is something that we've been targeting in terms of cancer care for several years. DNA is really that instruction manual for cells. It is the, the code book that tells every cell how to be what it is and how to make the proteins that it needs, how to grow in the way that it does. And, but DNA is constantly being copied. And as that occurs, errors happen over time. The PARP proteins are proteins that we have in every single cell that help us to make sure that our cells are being replicated properly. They're almost like a component of the proofreading, um, the proofreading system that is in our cells to make sure that those cells are copied properly. When the PARP proteins are not working properly, we don't get that proper replication of cells, we don't get that proper proofreading, and sometimes cells are, are copied, but they have errors in them. When they have errors in them, those errors can lead to those cells becoming cancer. So mutations in these DNA repair genes, and those are things like PARP genes that are our proofreading material, can be inherited those are germline mutations, or they can happen over time in each of our cells and lead to cancer in either case. When they're inherited or germline, these are things that we can both inherit from one of our parents and then pass on. Uh, but when they happen in our somatic system, which is just in a, 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 the prostate cancer cells themselves, for example, they're not gonna be passed on, but they can lead to a cancer in us, in our prostate. So these are things that we have to detect in order to target, and we have to detect in order to understand why a particular cancer is behaving the way that it does. When they happen in the germline, we can detect this by using saliva, we can use a cheek swab, we can use blood, um, and we can actually even test the tumor to understand if there is an inherited mutation that is causing that tumor and that is present potentially in all of our different cells. In the somatic system, this would be the prostate itself and only in the prostate, we would need to actually check the prostate tissue itself to understand if there was a mutation in a DNA repair mutation that, or a DNA repair gene that could be causing that prostate cancer. So ultimately we need to assess patients with prostate cancer, both in terms of their germline potential mutations and their somatic potential mutations to understand if they might have a mutation that is one, causing prostate cancer and two, something that could be targeted with the treatment that we want, would want to use. Ultimately, our guidelines agencies have addressed this by saying that all men with metastatic prostate cancer should get germline genetic testing. Again, this could be saliva, blood, cheek swab um, testing to really understand if they have something that they have inherited or something that they could pass on that could be related to prostate cancer progression. This could inform both their sons and their daughters of potential future cancer risk. Sons are in risk, at risk of prostate cancer development, and daughters are at increased risk of breast and ovarian cancer. And actually, both populations are at increased risk of developing pancreatic cancer and some colon cancers associated with these, these uh, genes. So it's important for us to understand and identify whether these mutations are present in anybody with prostate cancer. There have been several therapeutic trials that have assessed these mutations to understand whether we can target them with therapies that might be useful in really uh, being targeted treatments against the prostate cancer cells. The profound trial was a trial of Olaparib in metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. These are our most advanced, advanced prostate cancer patients to determine whether Olaparib, this targeted therapy against DNA repair defect mutation uh, genes could potentially target and kill prostate cancer cells more effectively than things like abiraterone or enzalutamide 
uh, after one has received the alternate agent enzalutamide or abiraterone in the past. And these patients all were enrolled. They all had already received abiraterone or enzalutamide in the past. And then they were randomized to get either a laparib or abiraterone or enzalutamide, the opposite thing that they had already had in the past to determine whether the olaparib could more effectively control their prostate cancer than that other agent. What they found was that there was a very clear advantage to being treated with olaparib versus the enzalutamide or abiraterone if they had already been exposed to one of those antigen receptor directed therapies in the past. So what we can say in English is that that blue line that we can see in each of these curves represent those patients who were treated with elaborate. The red line represents those patients who were treated with either enzalutamide or abiraterone after those patients had already received either enzalutamide or abiraterone in the past. And we can see both cancer progression-free survival and overall survival were improved if we switch from that androgen receptor targeted treatment, those pills for against the, the hormonal system to a lap rib versus continuing on the hormonal system pills alone. Triton 2 was a trial looking at rucaparib. This is another PARP inhibitor type therapy. This was um, really focused on only BRCA1 and BRCA2 in this particular trial. These are the most common um, DNA repair defects that we can see in prostate cancer. It also included patients who had ATM mutations, also relatively common in prostate cancer. In this trial, they enrolled patients who had these DNA repair defect mutations and everybody in the trial got recaparib. What we can see here on the left is that all of these blue lines re represent shrinking tumors after these patients were, were exposed to rucaparib. And all of the patients in this trial were, had metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, so pretty advanced prostate cancer, after they had already received abiraterone or enzalutamide and docetaxel chemotherapy or more therapies if that's what they had already had, but at least those therapies. On the right, you can see these declining, um, these declining lines show that these patients also had a decrease in their PSA when they were treated with rucaparib as compared um, to no treatment. So really, this is an incredible decrease in tumor size and decrease in PSA when these patients were exposed to rucaparib in this setting. So Olaparib is now approved for men with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer with a germline or somatic DNA repair gene mutation after treatment with an oral antigen receptor targeted agent. In, in normal language, that means uh, an oral pill like abiraterone or enzalutamide. And Rucaparib has been approved as of May of 2020 for men with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer with a germline or somatic BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation after treatment with an oral androgen receptor targeted agent, enzalutamide or abiraterone, and a chemotherapy, taxane based chemotherapy. So treatment of men with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer with elaparib or rucaparib can stop the cancer from growing. And to know whether PARP inhibitors might work, patients need germline testing and somatic tumor tissue testing. Germline testing um, is really important. This is testing that can help inform the patient so that he can inform his daughters and sons whether they may have to be on the lookout for prostate cancer or breast or ovarian cancer, depending if they're daughters or sons. Um, and these germline mutations can be passed to children and they can cause these cancers. So really understanding if, if a man has a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation among others can really help him inform his family whether or not they need to be um, having differences or, or be more diligent in terms of their breast, ovarian, or prostate cancer screening. All patients actually at this time with metastatic prostate cancer should have germline genetic testing. And in addition to this, germline testing, again, what you've inherited, what you could pass on, we also recommend that men understand what's in the cancer tissue itself because that could still be targeted with these newly approved medications. We also had some updated survival results for non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. So these are patients who have a rising PSA after uh, patients have undergone a prostatectomy or radiation, for example, and they're on things like 
androgen deprivation therapy, things like Lupron or Luprolide, Gaserolin, whatever injection keeps their testosterone low and their, their PSA is still going up. However, these patients actually can undergo scans, CT scans, bone scans. They have no sign of measurable cancer on these scans, but just have a rising PSA as their only sign of disease growth. These patients were enrolled in three different clinical trials, the Spartan trial, Prosper trial, and Aramis trial. Um, they were all designed very, very similarly. And these are the schemas for all three different trials. Um, Spartan on the top, looking at apalutamide, Prosper on the left, looking at enzalutamide, and Aramis on the right, looking at darolutamide. All included patients with non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. So rising PSA, scans negative, all patients on things like Luprolide, Dryptorolin, Gaserolin, so on ADT, PSA was rising. All of these patients in the trials were randomized to treatment with continued ADT with apalutamide, enzalutamide, or darolutamide, or placebo. And they were followed to determine whether those treatments, apalutamide, darolutamide, or enzalutamide, could delay the time to develop uh, developing metastatic cancer. What they found in all of these cases is that apalutamide, enzalutamide, and darolutamide prolonged metastasis-free survival, so prolonged the time to those patients developing metastatic cancer in every single case. And what was reported this year in 2020 was that it also prolonged overall survival. What that means is that the earlier patients can get apalutamide, enzalutamide, or darolutamide in their combination with their androgen deprivation therapy, even before they have clear metastatic disease on their scans. It doesn't matter what happens after that, they will have a longer survival on average in these clinical trials. So no matter what we do afterwards, if we can intensify androgen suppressive therapy earlier on, we can help people with prostate cancer live longer. And what I've said here in, in the words below the curves is that the separation of the curves in each of these settings really shows us that there's a difference between getting the one treatment versus the other. And the treatment on the top, the blue treatment, the purple treatment, or the orange treatment in each of these curves is the treatment that has a better survival in every setting. So on the left, it's apalutamide. In the middle, it's enzalutamide. On the right, it's darolutamide. In every setting, no matter what happens after that initial addition of apalutamide, enzalutamide, or darolutamide, these patients will live longer if they're given that early intensification of therapy. So treatment of men with non-metastatic CRPC was associated with longer time without metastatic prostate cancer and a longer survival, and that's the thing that we learned this year. The earlier you add these medications to standard ADT, the longer people live, no matter what they get as treatment later. And this is a really important concept, something we're really excited about. So finally, new radius pharmaceuticals that are not yet available, but are coming in the future, Prostate-specific membrane ant antigen, or PSMA, is a protein expressed on prostate cancer cells. And we use drugs like lutetium to target it. We don't want drugs that only target that particular protein, like on the left, this little bomb is targeting that little boat, and only that boat, and I assume it's going to blow that little boat up. What we want is what we see on the right, where we can target the general area of that little boat, and we get lots of things blowing up in all directions. Now, a nuclear medicine doctor gave me this slide and he's all about blowing things up with radiopharmaceuticals and I'm, I'm really excited for that, but the concept still stands. If we are too precise with our, uh, with our targeted therapy, we only get to destroy that one little boat. If we're a little less precise, but still kind of get things in the right area, we can get our target or get our treatment to the right area and then blow things up all around causing minimal damage to healthy tissues, but causing maximal damage to all the cancer cells in that region. We have seen over the last few years that these targeted treatments to PSMA, that protein on prostate cancer cells, can take people's scans from, as you see with all of these red spots, to, to the ones just to the right of them that show that all the red spots are disappeared. So that's because this PSMA targeted treatment can, can really destroy all those cancer cells very, very effectively. Now, 
that still has to be tested in clinical trials, is still being tested in clinical trials, but one of those trials reported out very recently and gave us a little bit of insight on how things are doing. This was a phase two trial called the therapy trial, looking at lutetium-177, which is a PSMA protein targeted therapy, a radio pharmaceutical for prostate cancer. Patients who had metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, again, a pretty advanced prostate cancer, were treated with either lutetium-177 radiopharmaceutical or cabazitaxel, which is a tried and true chemotherapy. And they were followed over time to determine whether or not they had a good PSA decrease and whether they ultimately survived longer um, from this treatment. Now we don't have the survival data yet, but we do have some information on how well their PSA was decreased. What we can see here is that the PSA response, which is in red if it was a yes, actually happened pretty substantially throughout the whole trial, but happened in more patients who were treated with lutetium on the right-hand side. So we see a lot more of these PSA red lines going down on the right-hand side related to treatment with lutetium than we do on the left-hand side of this figure with cabazitaxel. So that is really encouraging. It tells us that lutetium seems to work. We'll have to see where that goes. Lots of, lots of patients, lots of treatments will tell us where that goes ultimately. But ultimately, we have hope for prostate cancer and we're very excited as a field. And there's lots to be excited about. As you heard from Dr. Moses, and as I hope I shared with you, new approaches to androgen deprivation therapy or ADT include this oral agent for ADT, Relagolix, which is associated with not only great suppression of testosterone, but also a faster recovery of testosterone when we want to stop and lower cardiovascular risk when we compare it with the injection Luprolide. And Relagolix was actually approved in December of 2020 for any man who needs androgen deprivation therapy. So these pills are available. PARP inhibitors were approved to treat metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. They were approved in May of 2020. Germline and somatic testing are necessary to identify the right patients who might benefit from these targeted treatments. And remember, anyone with metastatic disease is eligible for germline testing to understand if that individual has a, a mutation that might make him susceptible to prostate cancer, but might make his children, his son susceptible to prostate cancer and his daughter susceptible potentially to breast or ovarian cancer. Olaparib and Arucaparib have been approved really to be targeted therapies that are effective against prostate cancer for men who have those mutations. Earlier, apalutamide, darolutamide, or enzalutamide can all be used to help men with non-metastatic CRPC live longer. They make it a longer time until we develop metastatic cancer, but also help men live longer no matter what treatments they receive after that initial therapy. And lutetium seems to cause PSA responses in men with metastatic CRPC, and hopefully this will translate into longer survival as well. So thank you so much for spending the time. Again, wonderful to see you here at the summit 2021. Thank you again for your support of Zero and for your support of men with prostate cancer. We are really appreciative to have you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Moses. Thank you, Dr. Morgans. What a great update on the latest and greatest in prostate cancer treatment. On behalf of the entire Zero team, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us virtually for this 2021 summit. As a reminder to those joining us, Zero Summit runs through March 4th. We have a lot more presentations coming your way that you won't want to miss. For more information about the summit and any additional topics, please visit our website at zerocancer.org. Thank you. The issues you care about most are right here at the Virtual Zero Prostate Cancer Summit. Please check out the other topics, sessions, and virtual get-togethers in your Summit app. Remember, you are not alone. Join the Zero community to gain support and more information on prostate cancer at zerocancer.org.